lens and a different framework. It's an honor to be here to speak with Nicole, Matt, uh, and David. And the one thing I'm going to say is that, you know, sometimes when I give this take on the opioid crisis, people really, uh, it doesn't sit very well with them. But we're actually sitting in a land of unintended consequences today. And there is as much uh, of the, and I don't like to use addiction as, as Matt quite kindly pointed out, we call it opioid misuse disorder. Uh, there's as much focus on that, but there needs to be more focus on the actual fallout of the patients now. And if you want to talk about stigma, talk about individuals who can't access their medications or who are afraid to talk about being on an opioid as a consequence of what the fallout will be in their environment. And so with that in the background, I'm going to start with uh, my take on how I think a lot of this started. And so, you know, uh, Tara Gomes and the Ontario Drug uh, Pain Research Network and David, they've done a lot of high-level research in terms of looking at where our data sits in the province with respect to opioid prescribing, et cetera. And when you look at a slide like that, and it's been all over the press for the last six years, uh, there's, a, there's a story to be told. And the story is, and the story you will all hear, is that 70%, and there has been a 70% increase in opioid-related mortality in the province of Ontario for the past 12 to 15 years. And that number moved from 367 individuals to last year being 867 individuals. And that is a net increase of 500 individuals and 7 to 10% consistent increase over time. And I think the pain world has come to grips and the physician world has come to grips with the fact that we do have an overprescribing issue and we do have to start to fix some of the wrongs that we've, we've actually created in, 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 uh, in the way we prescribe opioids. But what we shouldn't have done was actually call out physicians and actually start to say that the reason that people are dying is part of it, is the prescription pad. And I'll, and I'll show you some data that might bring that, um, that assumption into question. And so where we sat maybe five or six years ago, we've now swung the pendulum to this side. I can tell you uh, multiple stories of patients that I'm seeing in my clinic that have been prescribed for 15 or 20 years and have been on their stable opioid doses. Um, let's say they're on a, uh, four or 500 milligrams and they walk into their physician's office and because of the, the, the culture that we're sitting in and the times that we are sitting in today, we'll be told that I'm sorry, you are now an addict and you have your last script from me, I can't help you anymore, and you have 30 days to find a new prescriber. And somehow that is acceptable, and it should never be acceptable. And what does that individual who's now a highly functioning um, uh, worker with a family with two children, she has about 30 days to save her life today. She has to find a physician within the next 30 days to prescribe that dose, or as you've heard from Matt, uh, that uh, opioid withdrawal scenario can be a complete life changer. She will be destabilized, potentially lose her work, and her family will be in jeopardy. What about the young 27-year-old who walks into my office two days ago, actually? He has an autoimmune condition. It's continuing to spike up and down. He has, for the last six years, because of where we have taken this with, from the media's lens, unable to get an opioid during his acute pain flares. Now, opioids are for acute pain. He is buying his illicit opioid every time he flares, so that's about six or eight times a year, and has never been able to get a prescribed opioid in the last five or six years. This young man was in my clinic on Tuesday. I offered to prescribe him an opioid, and he cried. And he said, Doctor, at the end of the day, I know every time I'm heading down this road, given the context we are in today, I am putting my life in jeopardy. And I, 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 I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with happiness and, and gratitude. And this is something that, unfortunately, is happening to hundreds of thousands of, of individuals and millions if we look at North America uh, today. And so we really have to look at what we're, what, what's happening. And so this is one of my favorite slides because, you know, if we look at that top right corner, this is where Canada probably sat about five or six years ago. And as much as we were sit standing now in the land of unintended consequences, there were unintended consequences occurring of having a prescription surplus into society. And so where can doctors fix this problem? Well, one, we can stop having a, a diversion issue on a grand scale, and, and I'll talk about some of those solutions as we get near the end of this talk. And we didn't have many of the safe injection sites as we do today, and we, and we probably need more, and I'm a big harm reductionist, and I, and, I, and I absolutely do support our safe injection sites. 
But what we've missed here is the link from the top right to the bottom left. And there is a huge pathway from A to B. And unfortunately, we are squeezing the bigger side of the problem and heading down uh, and, and de devoting a lot of resources to this side. And so the issue that we have at hand is how do we actually start to support the entire continuum? And this is something we'll talk about. Well, here's one way we could potentially support the continuum. We can create Canada's national opioid guidelines. And we can come up with a magic number based on the American CDC guidelines, which says that 90 milligrams is now the safe dose. And I will tell you that these guidelines, they're going to be fantastic for five to 10 years from now, when we have patients with specific ceilings, we have physicians talking to patients about an end to that opioid prescribing. If you want to fly a plane, you should know how to land it. If you want to prescribe a medication, you should know how to stop it and where those safe limits are. And to date, we probably didn't do that very well. But if you want to talk about an opioid crisis, you now talk about those hundreds of thousands of people out there above 90 milligrams. And, and Matt has just insightfully said that a lot of them are landing in the place that we didn't anticipate because physicians are now feeling threatened at prescribing above these guidelines. And we need to re-educate society, we need to re-educate physicians, we need to re-educate everyone as to where we sit and how we safely bring these people from these high doses back down to the lower doses. And hopefully our new Minister of Health, Petty Poe Taylor, will make some different decisions instead of knee-jerk reactions to this crisis solution. And so I get calls from uh, you know, uh, some of the American states and, and policymakers, and they say, well, Dr. Clark, we're, we're going to um, limit prescribing to seven days because we think this is a good thing. And I said, oh, that's great. And then Walmart will announce that we're going to save this crisis because we're not going to dispense more than five days at a time of opioids, and that's going to be a good thing. And I assume you're going to expect Walmart to then put forth the next press release that they're not going to charge dispensing fees every five days. So that one script now becomes 50 extra dollars for that low socioeconomic individual. And you can see how this is a marketplace on all angles, not just on, on uh, one. And so this is two months ago. So this is where we now have to start re-educating. I didn't see this on the front page news. But the, uh, the BC Death Review Panel actually came out and said that, and, and Matt actually echoed this, that we certainly haven't found this link between prescriptions and opioid-related deaths. 80% of the 1,471 deaths in BC were due to those who died from uh, illicit drug use, and 30% of those deaths were due to inmates that were released uh, within the past couple of years. And so, you know, docs were not Silly. We actually respond to what we're being told. And the fact is, we have reduced our overall opioid prescribing by almost 10% across uh, Canada. What happened in 2013? You've heard both speakers talk about the fact that OxyContin was taken off the market. And everyone could have predicted what then might ensue. Well, this is what occurred in BC. So you see where the OxyContin that had a specific street value is now gone, gave you, it is for sure, when uh, a company called INC Research did a study uh, several years ago where they took some of the population off of, uh, that, were, that were the uh, drug users off and they weaned them and they looked for which drug gave you that euphoric high that you were actually seeking for, that pleasure that you're seeking, an OxyContin one hands down. And so what was the next best analog? It was fentanyl. And so any of you in this room you can go home tonight, you can actually log on your computer, you can buy about $10,000 worth of illicit Asian fentanyl, use your organized crime connections, get it across the border, get it into your basement, and it's going to be worth almost $1.4 million in the North American marketplace. So this is the crisis. This is what we're seeing in terms of why our prescription pads, whether they come down, whether they stay stable, are not really being tied to what we're seeing in terms of death. And fentanyl is not fentanyl is not fentanyl. Our labs can only test fentanyl. We're just now catching up to be able to test things like carfentanyl, W18, some of these other Asian synthetic fentanyls. So what is the pain patient saying? The pain patient saying this was a year after the CDC guidelines were released and that 90 milligrams should be those new doses uh, uh, moving forward. And of course, those patients are going to be saying, well, you know, and this is a pain sample, so it's a bit of a bias here, that my pain's worse, you know, I, I'm now being forced weaned, et cetera, off of my medications. But the most worrisome stat 
11% of them said, well, we've lost hope in this whole system, and I'm just going to start to buy my opioids illicitly because that's where I can actually access them because the pipeline has been completely cut off or pulled out from under me. And so just to ensure that you understand that what I'm saying is backed by data and, and not just my take, this is Ontario's emergency visits in the past three years. We have almost doubled our emergency visits as a consequence of this opioid crisis. There's two slides I really want you to think about, and this is one of them. So this was, again, ODPRN uh, Health Quality Ontario data last year. We have 13 million Ontarians. We prescribe opioids to 1.9 million individuals for a prescription total of 9 million scripts on an annual basis. If we go back and now think about where and what the rate of opioid misuse disorder is in our population, and the gurus are the guys like Mel Cahan at Women's College, et cetera, I've heard everything from 5%, and Matt said I think 8% to 25%. Well, I can tell you the pain world, who actually eight years ago would have said to you, yes, and I saw the stat outside that we are one of the top prescribing uh, um, world, countries in the world. Well, that's a pretty good thing. We have palliative care programs. We take care of our patients' acute pain needs. We're proud of that. We can back off now and say, though, that 15% of these individuals might actually have an opioid misuse disorder. And now let's look at that number, and let's put in context 865 deaths. If we don't fix the messaging that has been put forth to the public, if we don't fix the fear of what we're doing with individuals, especially that are being prescribed opioids, that number is a drop in the bucket because we have hundreds of thousands of people out there above 90 milligrams. And how we get them from A to B safely is really what we should be talking about and, and not the fact that it's the prescription pad necessarily killing everyone. This is a tragic slide. It is certainly one that has been put forth time and time again in the past five years. This is a young man who came in, had his operation. I'm an anesthesiologist. He walks out of the hospital following surgery with an opioid based medication, no look into what those risk factors are, and we know what those risk factors are that lead you to potentially have a prolonged opioid use, et cetera. He dies two and a half years later of an inadvertent, inadvertent injection of heroin, which was laced with carfentanil. And this, when it was first reported, was a direct link to my prescription pad. And unfortunately, now the story is coming out that is, it is not as linear as we think. And absolutely, we do need to change. We just need to do it appropriately. This is the second slide I really want you to think about and think very clearly about. This is data to be released, and I'm sharing it here for the first time tonight. 1.3 million people make up this, this graph in front of you. We are, have government agencies that are handing out money to solve the opioid crisis. And the premise is that the more we prescribe, the more people are dying, and we should make broad blanket changes for an entire society based on specific messaging. How many people do you think you died, died post-operatively out of this 1.3 or had a post-operative opioid overdose out of 1.3 million individuals? 134. If you walk into our institutions and you're not on an opioid, the likelihood of you having an overdose is almost zero. If you walk into an institution and you're already taking 50 milligrams of an opioid or 100 milligrams of an opioid, which is above our safe guidelines, not only does your number jump to 142 per 100,000, we actually cause harm to you. And it's finding the pockets in society from the physician standpoint that we can actually fix. That's how we go about tackling this, not making broad blanket strokes because we think we can link things uh, inappropriately to a practice pattern. I won't say very much here. That's the whole premise of the service we started at Toronto General Hospital in terms of finding these pockets postoperatively. It's being replicated across the, uh, the country now, and so we're pretty proud of some of the work that we've done. Let me just back up to this slide. But here's a story I'm going to share with you. I was at the Euro Cup a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, we had just started our transitional pain service, and we ran into five graduating general surgery residents um, as we were traveling through France. And they were from Edmonton, and I remember meeting them, and I said to them, gentlemen, so you're, you're now done, you're, you're gonna start your practices. 
And what are you going to do for that high-dose opioid patient who you detect potentially an opioid misuse problem as they're about to leave the hospital? And they said, I have no idea. I'm just going to give them what the hell they want and hope they never come back. All right? And that's where we've been sitting from an education standpoint. And these are the things that we can certainly change and certainly start to attack and move forward. I'm going to show you some other things that we can actually do to, to, uh, to help things. And, you know, what's actually been positive is it's been about two months now that Paul Taylor, uh, he's, a, he's a writer for Sunnybrook, reached out to me and said, you know, I'm getting constant calls about patients saying that I've been on my opioids for years and now I can't access them and what do I do? And I said, well, the first thing we need to do is actually start to get that messaging out so that this tide starts to change. And we know that we have hundreds of thousands of people on 90 milligrams. We know that we have no evidence-based solutions on how to safely take these people down. We know that if you want to do this, you have to deal, as you've heard already, with your psychological health and all of those things that potentially lie beneath. If someone is taking well over 400 or 500 milligrams a day, they've probably passed the threshold of pain and they're dealing with some opioid-induced hyperalgesia, some of these other concepts that they just need to be educated about and, and talked about, and some of them can take different pathways. But what was most um, uh, impressive was that for the first time in five years, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario that have been sitting there in the background doing nothing and watching have now started to say that if you're a patient and you're getting weaned aggressively or inappropriately, please contact the college. And so now patients can feel empowered. When your doctor retires and you're now one of a thousand of those uh, patients that can't access your medication and won't ever be given an appointment by a doctor because today somehow it is appropriate to say that if you are on an opioid, I don't need to see you as a physician. 30% of the population has chronic pain. What have we done? And so this is certainly a move in the right direction. Anybody know what those pills are? Or what they look like? They look like oxycodone and oxycontin. What's in them? Fentanyl. The number of patients that are now coming into my clinic and we're urine testing, and they think they're taking oxycodone because that's what they think they're buying, and they show up with fentanyl. And they're as surprised as you are. And the fact is, you never know how much fentanyl is in that pill that they're about to take. And so this is a problem. So what are we actually doing? What are we doing as a society? Well, at least we're taking steps to try to fix this. And so, you know, in BC, if you have an overdose and you show up to emerge, we'll send a note to your family doc. So actually, there's some information that you've actually done this, and that's a positive step. We're gonna, we have in Ontario an opioid stewardship program for docs that are having trouble and they have high-dose opioid patients. They're not sure what to do. We are actually improving naloxone kits, and, and you, you saw the problem from Nicole in terms of the First Nations, and, and this is something that we continue to do. We also have provincial committees, and Ontario's had a ton of them over the past several years heading down the direction of, of solutions, and so uh, I'm really happy about that. So I'm going to leave you with a couple scenarios here, and you know, this is one of the things that I think we really have to think really hard about as a society. If we have an opioid crisis, and we as physicians are sitting in the front line of this crisis, and I have a patient that I'm seeing, and he may be, you know, a middle-aged, elderly, and what, just so you know, the highest opioid diverters are individuals above 65, okay? It's not your young male that's 22 years old. And so I have patients that I, you know, I've learned this, I've been doing this for well over 10 years now, that, you know, I've cut by 30%, and I see them three or four weeks later, they come in and they're doing just fine. Great, Mr. So-and-so, you're doing fantastic. Three and a four weeks later, he comes back, but so does his son. And his son says, Doc, you cut my dad's opioids by 30%. He can't sleep, he can't brush his teeth, he can't comb his hair. What have you done? And this plays on for a little while, and eventually I just have enough. And I say, so how much are you making off your dad's scripts? And all hell breaks loose. And they walk out of my office, and I never see them again. Where do you think they went? They went two blocks down to continue whatever was happening in my office two blocks later. And we know there are strategies that can help with that. We know that real-time monitoring prescriptions can help with that. And so that's something we really have to become serious about. But you tell me why I, as a provider, can't pick up the phone and reach out to the law enforcement arm and say, something's up here. Why don't you take a look? And that's where our college and the law enforcement 
folks need to start to talk about. And one of the last committees that were formed by the Ontario government actually brought everybody to the table, and I thought that was a pretty powerful uh, committee. So this is Mr. Ross, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and I'm going to let him tell you his story, but he is an individual that, unfortunately, and I've told you the problems, and on the prescribing world, he's an individual who has had about 13 surgeries in the last 11 years, okay? He was to the point where his pain regimen, and this is where we really go wrong, and this is where we can be called out for, became injecting 30 milligrams of subcutaneous hydromorphone every two hours. His children got to the point where they said, you cannot see your grandchildren anymore. He never has bought an illicit opioid on the street. This is what our system has done to this gentleman. He came in in tears, what do I do? But how do you convince someone that has been on this path for 20 years to change their course? They will tell you that this is what I need. This is how I avoid my withdrawal. This is what supposedly treats my pain, but my pain is eight or nine out of 10. We have to stop treating numbers. Pain is not a number, it's a function and how you function in your life should determine your treatment. It should determine what doctors do to actually fix and move you forward. And so Mr. Ross, after 30 weeks of engaging with us, got to the place where he decided, you know what, I'm gonna try this Suboxone scenario. He spent weeks with our psychologists, weeks with our physiotherapists, and eventually decided to try something else. And so I'm gonna leave you with his words in terms of uh, what happened to him uh, on the next slide. And I think you have to play from your end. You'll see it in the bottom right corner there. Yeah, there it is. I was prescribed opioids, in my case hydromorphone, self-injected, because I was in chronic pain following multiple surgeries over the course of the last 12 years. No, I'm not a junkie on the street. I get my prescriptions legitimately. However, Uh, over the course of the years, I realized that hydromorphone was not treating my pain. All it was doing was dulling my life and making it very, very difficult, both for me and my family. I needed a different way to manage my pain. I needed to find a different solution to my problem because I wanted to rejoin society in a normal way and not have everything fuzzed over. I know that I will never be able to get rid of my pain entirely, but if I can manage it, I can continue living properly. And so I'm finishing with that, but I do want to leave you with the message that I am getting consults on a daily basis for the functioning 70-year-old woman who has never had anxiety, who has never had an addiction issue, and asked whether she should be prescribed her five Percocets a day so that she can get out of her bed and go and have her coffee with her friends. And that is a problem.